we are both from Binghamton University, um, and we are both from the libraries from the Digital Scholarship Department. Ooh. We do a lot of support um, for digital humanities projects on campus, um, and we're just going to kind of give a year in review of what it's been like to sort of uh, launch and introduce people to SUNY Create, um, which is a domain of one's own. So next slide. So. Um, it's just, yeah, like I said, year in review kind of from our perspective of, of uh, introducing people to this service. So next slide. So digital scholarship in the library, we're fairly new. We just got founded in 2018. Amy's position was created specifically um, for digital scholarship in the library. And our community has really grown out of a summer institute that we do um, sort of every other summer called the Digital Humanities Research Institute. Um, and um, also um, digital scholarship in DH is fairly new to Binghamton. We just became a, kind of an R1 public uh, university um, and a lot of the research that we're doing is still very much traditional. Um, so a lot of the work we do in the library is trying to promote um, DH and digital scholarship as scholarship and just make it more visible, um, the work that people are doing. Um, and as part of that, um, through the SUNY system, um, which is our state system, um, we are using SUNY Create. So on Binghamton's campus, the sort of importance of digital scholarship is telling stories and it's making them more public um, and more accessible not only in the sense of kind of branching out academia to public spaces, but the work that's being done is very much community building. So making these communities in Binghamton or around Binghamton um, have a space to go um, to learn from each other or to tell each other's stories um, and make that more accessible to them. Um, so we have a few different projects going on. We have a Wisdom of the People um, project that's a graduate student project that's just to make philosophy more accessible, to make the conversations around philosophy more public and accessible. Immigrants Wake America is another podcast um, hosted by Shruti Jane and Lily um, that just uh, interviews uh, different immigrants and um, their experience of being immigrants in America. Um, and um, then we uh, remigration of Pakistani diaspora, which is more of a um, like oral history project being done um, by a graduate student. Um, and in addition to the projects, we have a few different like working groups um, and programs on campus that are also in engaging in this work. So obviously we have the library, which is through our digital scholarship center. Um, and a lot of what we do is kind of the hands-on workshop tutorial tool kind of focused things. Um, but we also offer a lot of networking events and community building events um, for the people kind of to showcase what they're doing in their projects. Um, but then also to connect our programs on campus like DITA, which is a digital and data studies. It's like liberal uh, computing in the liberal arts kind of style program. Um, and then all of our kind of various working groups across campus. So we have a spatial humanities working group. We have like a graduate digital history interest group, a data visualization history group. And I guess kind of the point is that this work is happening kind of all around campus. There's no one centralized spot um, that people are working in or are interested in. Um, it's kind of an entire network of people. Um, and then us in the libraries are kind of like a little bit of a hub, and then trying to give people the access and support they need to continue these projects um, and work on them. So next slide. And then, yeah, why digital scholarship? Right now at Binghamton, a lot of digital scholarship is focused in DH, and it's really focused in this public, engaged, community-building way. And um, people are looking for platforms they're looking for space, they're looking for collaborations, um, just to help get these voices out. And that's the voices of themselves as researchers, it's the voices of their communities, 
um, that are looking to connect with each other. And um, you know, it's the voices of the, the people and the things that they've researched um, that have not yet been explored. Um, so how we fit SUNY Create into all of that. Um, a lot of what people really like about SUNY Create is it's a sandbox for them. Um, and they like that it's a centralized space that they can go to um, that has a bunch of different tools and platforms that they can learn from and use. Um, but they know that they have support for what they're doing on there from the library. Um, because Amy and I are both um, admins. We do a lot of classroom instruction. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultation work um, with graduate students, with faculty, with professional staff. It's all across the university. Um, so they know where to go when they're looking for something new to explore or um, use for a project, and then they know they have support for it. Um, and sort of what we're going to be covering is a lot of the supporting material we've created. Um, could you go to the choosing a platform? Choosing a platform is the biggest question we get. Like, I have this project. What do I use? What's the best part um, for using it? So I started putting together, and this is not complete, but I don't want to make it too big, <laughs> um, <laughs> like a little like story map. So what are you considering? What is the content that you have is kind of where we start. Um, so do you have something that you want to be a digital collection or exhibit? Or are you thinking more of like a blog type style where you have some research, you have some multimedia, maybe you don't need like a whole blown blog site, just like a page to tell a story. Um, but, and then you can kind of go down, digital collection and exhibit ends in Omeka. So I'm like, if you're not bothering with a bunch of metadata stuff, <laughs> Like, that's not your jam. We don't, let's not go over there. <laughs> let's just, let's go back over to the blog site. <laughs> um, so this, this, but this helps them. Like, if they get to the bottom and they're like, I'm, this is what I wanted, they can go back up and kind of reroute. Um, so this is one uh, thing, and all the blue dots are things that are SUNY create, just to make it really obvious where things are. The library does have a, our own Omeka S server, so we kind of talk about the difference. Like, do you want to manage your whole own server? Probably not, so we can do that for you. Um, and then, yeah, just like other um, options. So usually we land on something or a couple different things that they go out and explore and maybe try and add a couple things and figure out the functionality because that's the next question. Like, how do you want your users to interact with the things that you are creating and you are making for them? Um, and a lot of it, especially for the people who are making podcasts, is just I want them to be able to play the podcast on the web page. So then we talk about how you can do that and how you can do that in a lot of different places. <laughs> but we'll, you know, pick the one that feels right to you. And a lot of this also covers like how comfortable are you with being digital? Because a lot of them are not comfortable with being digital. They are new. Um, so, we, so that's in there too. And then if you go back. And then a lot of the other conversation, because a lot of the questions we get um, when we're talking about SUNY Create is like, well, do I own my content? It's like, yes, you own your content. But they don't know if they own their content and if they are insecure about owning their content, how to maintain ownership of their content. So we talk about Creative Commons a lot um, as far as like putting that on your podcast and your images mm -hmm. and stuff like that, the things you're using to build the final site. Um, there's a whole file management side to this um, that we also go over. So the three, two, one rule, like three copies, two different mediums, one and off site. And like these basics are mind blowing to them. Um, I have said, just make a project folder and that's what you keep all your stuff in. And here's like file hard keys. And they're like, I, this has changed my life. Um, so just these basics um, really are what we are focusing on. And then also um, I put together a little project management plan for them because this is also new because you get into to academia sometimes and you're just used to like writing paper after paper after paper and you don't realize that you're going through a process each time you do that. Um, so encouraging them to like step back, think about all of these different processes 
that go into these long-term or somewhat long-term digital projects um, and working through those different parts. So, um, yeah, and there's a whole other talk of like how much we really borrow from the business world in digital humanities with like our project plans and our file management and all that, um, but yeah, that's next slide. Um, so something else that we, we've learned as kind of a lessons learned as we've gone through this process um, is to have things like documentation. Um, we started with having Okmaka S, which was something uh, that was added on two weeks after I started in a brand new position uh, as digital scholarship librarian, and nobody really knew what they wanted to do with it. They just had promised a faculty member, we will have somebody teach you how to use this, and your class can use it, um, really, which could have been a blog site for what they wanted to do, um, but it was what was given to us. Um, and because we have people use these different sites, some are using it for their research projects, some are using it with their classes. Um, so you have these different levels of responsibilities or different levels of what people want to do with these different platforms um, that we need to just clarify in the start of what's our role versus what's your role as a researcher or what's your role as an instructor. Um, and what are the roles of the students too and how can you maybe help them learn these best practices along the, the class journey that they're in. So one of the things we've created um, that we now use for both Omeka S and SUNY Create is an MOU. Um, and in this MOU, this basically is just a Google form. Um, and we send this to people after they have uh, requested to have a SUNY Create site or they've reached out to us and want to have an Omeka S instance of some sort. Um, and this covers a lot of things regarding you know, who's, in, who's responsible for backing up the content of the site that you're building. Um, and who is responsible when it comes time to migrate or plan for a migration to another site, um, which is the researcher's or instructor's responsibility. Um, we also talk about adding content to their sites. Um, we have had instances where people thought that they came to us and they give us all their stuff and then we build the sites for them. Um, so we had to make that clear that it's, um, we, we provide support for you and can help answer questions, but it's your responsibility to build the content on your sites. Um, it also talks about being clear that you understand any content you put on your site must adhere to copyright laws, um, or you do have the permission to be sharing them in some way. Um, and we do have our takedown policy linked in here as well, um, so people can take a look at what goes into if somebody does make a request that something's being shared on one of our sites without permission, um, what our process is for going through a take, anything with takedown. Um, and then we also talk about if there's no activity uh, after a year of having the site. So if somebody signs up for SUNY Create um, and then does nothing with it for over a year, we're, we do have limited number of people that can use SUNY Create. Um, so we have a policy where we'll reach out after a year if we see no activity at all, just to make sure you're still planning to come back to this at some point. We know people get swamped with different things. Um, so as long as we hear from somebody, we'll leave it active. Um, and also just making sure people have read and uh, understand best practices for accessibility, um, which is something we also provide them that they, they know that they're responsible for making sure if they make the site public, that they're responsible for it being, meeting the best practices of Binghamton's uh, accessibility standards. Um, and to help educate on that, um, a lot of the times, as soon as we say web accessibility, a lot of people don't understand what that really means um, at this point. And a lot of the times, as Ruth was saying, people are coming into this not really knowing how to build these sites already or already feeling overwhelmed. They need to learn how to teach it to their students. Um, so understanding everything with accessibility and how do you do that in a semester if you're doing it with students um, becomes a challenge. Or um, how do you do that as your own project if you're on a grant and you're on a time constraint or you're a graduate student creating a project and you want that done before you graduate, um, how, do you, how do you make this all meet that? Um, so something we've come up with is an accessibility checklist. Um, and this is something we had reviewed by a group at Binghamton called TAG, which is our technology access advisory group. Um, and our web designer from the libraries is also on that group, so he helped us with making sure we, we hit at least what, what minimum people should have to make their sites accessible. Um, so we put together this checklist that walks people through what's required and what that means. 
Um, so we talk about things like alt text, we talk about things like page headings, transcriptions, closed captions, um, how to add descriptions to your hyperlink text, um, just the basics that we, we feel all the sites should have um, to then meet the requirements that we need at, at least Binghamton. Um, and we also give them some additional uh, strongly recommended ones that we know may not be as easy to um, adhere to, but we do recommend doing. Um, and additional resources for people to be able to ch check out their own site. Um, so things to be able to check out what your site looks like to people with different levels of colorblindness. Um, using the uh, extension on your browser, like Wave or anything, to t test the site yourself and see what comes up as inaccessible. Um, and then just some other links for people to be able to access with that. Um, and one thing we have to do too at Binghamton, um, because we are the uh, administrators of the site, we will have to um, run annual checks of any site that is made public um, by classes or researchers, um, which is something we, we haven't done yet because we haven't hit the year mark, but we're coming up on it pretty quickly. Um, so we're gonna get to learn what we need to learn <laughs> about how that process goes um, and when we reach out to people, um, who responds and you know how, how people are able to, to meet these requirements. And one of the big things that it does become a challenge, especially with instructors and students because we can educate on these best practices with them. Um, it, it, they, you can talk to the students about it, but they, they have a time constraint on how long that they actually have to work on these digital projects. And for a lot of them to learn this whole platform in a semester and also try to meet all these standards and meet all the requirements for the assignments that come into it, it can be a lot and it's very overwhelming. Um, and so we'll see a lot of times Instructors may not want to make their site public because it's not meeting all these things, um, or some do, and then we have to come back to it, and we'll have to figure that out as we, we hit this date of having to put this out there. Um, but another thing that uh, comes up, and we put this at the end of our presentation, um, because commonly this stuff ends up being discussed at the end, if at all. Um, sometimes it's not discussed at all, uh, but it's stuff that's really important to be talked about at the beginning of projects, during projects, and at the end, just having a continuous idea of what your plan is for migrating your project, what your plan is for archiving your project, and what your plans are for preserving your project if you want it to be accessible long term. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, thank you. We're working on it. <laughs> Um, but so some things we tried to talk to people about, especially, you know, sometimes we don't have people come to us until three to six months after they're already starting something. And then we have to talk to them about where they have to go backwards. And that gets very frustrating for people, um, especially when they're on those time constraints. Um, so some things we do try to talk to them about um, with migration, you know, just the general, think about where you would want to migrate this project to when you leave Binghamton. Um, especially our graduate students, because they may no longer have access to things that they did at Binghamton. Um, so do they want to create their own domain of one's own uh, that they can migrate it to, or do they have other options available to them? Um, understanding how long it takes to migrate a project, depending on how complex your project is and how much different types of media you have, it could take a while. Um, and emphasizing um, just the support and the backing up of all the content. Um, which is something we talk about every, every stage of it. Did you back it up? Where did you back it up? How many places have you backed it up? Um, and talking about not having it all on this one device in this same room that you have everything else in um, and keeping that in, in mind. Um, and so with that, just you know, what understanding what type of files are part of your, your project, just having that file management uh, and, and structuring available. Um, what options are out there for you. Uh, we do have an institutional repository at Binghamton. Um, so some projects could have some components of it at least put on the repository, uh, whereas others may not be able to. Um, so what does that look like for students who are creating uh, a variety of projects or uh, especially with digital storytelling, we have a lot of people who are putting together um, things that have video and audio and interactive features to it that just may not have the capability that can go in the orb. Um, but we do have students who are creating podcasts um, that we can put into the orb for them. Um, so we have their, or their podcasts all accessible, freely accessible there as well while they put it out on streaming. Um, and again, that 
Uh, where are you backing all this project up in case it takes longer to migrate an archive? And then just the, the preservation. The, the big question is the, how long do you realistically expect this project to remain viable? Um, a lot of the times, you know, we want to think that our project 20, 30 years from now is going to be still exactly what it was, um, but as we even heard from Kathleen this morning, there's a lot of changes that have happened over time. Um, some things last and some things don't, um, but that's where it's nice when we're in this open environment that people can continue to build on what they originally started with and migrate elsewhere. They can uh, learn web archiving. Um, it's something that we want to uh, do more education on with people who are having these digital projects on, on best practices of web archiving and keeping track of their projects. Um, and just understanding what aspects of their projects they do want to preserve. They may create this, this massive uh, digital media site and they only want to keep um, the videos or the audio they created from it. They don't really want the, the written text from it. Um, so understanding, you know, prioritize what media that you want to be saved first. Um, and also with that too, something that um, I went to at, uh, NYU uh, which was for a failure camp, um, which was led by Ashley Maynard. Um, and she shared with us this digital project self-assessment um, that she put under a CC license to be reused. Um, so we've been taking this and we want to start talking to people at the start of their conversations about having these self-assessments of just understanding, does your project need to be digital? And do, why do you want it to be digital? Um, and understanding what that means to have a digital project. Um, if you, if you start out by understanding, you know, like what the audience is, what the audience is, what else is already out there, and what the impact of your project will be, um, making sure this is something you really want to know, and also being real with yourself on what your challenges and limitations are. Um, there's, we all have challenges when it comes to creating the digital projects, whether it be resources, um, being able to have that server space. That's a common one, at least at Binghamton. Um, Having people with all the different types of expertise, we have um, projects, for example, where they have students who uh, come on as a, a grad assistant and they're writing code for them, but they're going to graduate and they're not going to finish the project by the time that the faculty member is ready to, to put it out there. So then what do you do with this code that's half written that you don't fully understand what it even does um, and how do you make sure that that's going to be carried on uh, continuously with other students or if you're going to learn it. Um, and just having that timeline and workflow ready to go for these different stages between when you're working on your project, but also having those workflows for the migration and the preservation side of it. Um, that's, that's our gig. <laughs> I'll rephrase my question for the people out there. Hello, people out there. Um, do you have resources in the orb for archiving not just text and images and podcasts, but also video and other different media? And is that like part of what you'll archive or are you looking for other ways? And then my other question is, do you get requests for research projects, other projects where the cPanel um, lamp environment isn't enough? that people need something beyond that. So those are my two questions, and thanks for a great talk. Yeah, uh, I'll ask the or into the orb. Yeah, you, I don't know anything <laughs> about the orb. Um, so we can archive video content into the orb, and right now I'm working on some guidelines for it. The orb was something that started uh, about a year and a half before I got there, um, and there it's, it's, it's evolved in itself, so there wasn't really much, much guidelines to it. They did have one. Uh, guideline of like what they were seeing people interested in putting in there, but it's changed so much with students creating these digital projects um, and having me media content. Um, so I'm working on better guidelines to help people understand archiving. I've been working on our with our metadata expert in the library um, to make sure people understand metadata and, and how to actually um, make their information discoverable and explainable to a public audience. 
um, and following accessibility best practices in there too. So if you want your video in there, it needs closed captions. If you want your audio in there, it needs transcriptions. Um, so we're, it's a work in progress, but we're getting there with that. And um, right now it has a lot of capabilities like that, which is nice. Um, we haven't run into anything quite yet that people haven't been able to share in it, which is awesome. Uh, what's the word built on? Uh, it's digital commons. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, and to the other point, we do, we did have uh, someone approach us with a sort of half-built project that they were looking for a space for um, that the LAMP server was not going to work around, but had they come to us before building, that would have been a, per a perfectly serviceable environment for them. So a lot of it is just making us more visible, making the services we have more visible so people come to us before they start building. So if they do run into a problem, which this person did, of not having space for it, we can make sure that the project and the space meld. Yeah. We have the bit.ly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Top. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and everything's linked. I don't know if everything's shared public, but if you run into a link, you can just let us know. I think they're all public, but I'll, I can double check after. Feels like I'm talking to a battery pack. Um, <laughs> like, again, thank you for this great presentation. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I need to see everywhere. Um, now, you're in the SUNY system, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you work with Binghamton University. Uh, are you connecting with the SUNY system as a whole in any way? Are you? Following the famous promise of systemness. Not enough. Yeah. Not we, enough. we have our, our yeah. good friend here, Ed Beck, from SUNY Oneonta, that we talk with quite often. Um, yeah. We do have some colleagues that we communicate with yeah. between Albany, um, Geneseo, and then uh, sometimes Buffalo and Stony Brook with, with different things that are going on. Um, we have tried for this stronger community, especially in digital scholarship and SUNY. Um, a lot of it was happening um, post-2020, yeah. um, and then things are just slowly starting to be more communicative again. Um, yeah. So right now we have Ed at least, but we, we're hoping to try to grow this more, and we've been talking and brainstorming mm -hmm. ways of how we can make more of a community across SUNY and share these resources uh, more openly across the SUNYs, because we have, we have schools too that um, have very little funding compared to what some of our oh, yeah. bigger ones yeah. do. Yeah. Um, and so they don't have access to a lot of the stuff that we do, so how can we help support them um, so that they can also be doing at least some of the things that they sure. want to be doing? Yeah. Sure, great. Okay, we're at time. We're at time, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all. You.